Edward A. Graves, author of Sully's American West, and if you've an interest, I'll tell you the greatest stories from America's great old West. But as you know, first things first. This time around, I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to tell you a story directly from my book, Sully's American West. A reading, if you like. Now, to set the scene, Sully has just recently set out on his travels into the West. He makes his way by a wagon that's outfitted to prepare meals for whatever gathering of people he encounters who can pay for the service. Most are willing and anxious for a good meal, and his reputation for providing them is spreading. It's 1864, and he is approaching Westport, which, unknown to Sully, will soon become the site of the greatest Civil War battle in the West. He's approached by a Confederate officer, 2nd Lieutenant Charles Fletch Taylor of the Missouri Raiders. He commissions Sully to prepare a meal for his men and his commander, who will be joining them for certain private discussions. They provide the provisions while Sully provides the cooking and serving services. The meal goes exactly as planned and everyone is happy and well satisfied, including the visiting commander who Sully meets only briefly, but long enough to sense the courage and danger inherent to the man. The sun had set and all the men had returned to their nearby camp as Sully went about his solitary chores of cleaning and putting up. We set the scene. Now let me set the storytelling mood. larger font for older eyes and forgive me in advance I'm a better writer than I am a reader so forgive the flub ups to the story that was when I noticed Fletch and his commander approaching me Sully said Fletch as they approached we'd like a word for just a moment I feared that my food or hosting had fallen short but I could not imagine how the other man stepped forward and extended his hand Sully it is then I was at once relieved at his extended hand, but could not help but experience some level of fear from his gaze. Yes, sir, Sully from Ireland. I shook his hand. It was then that I saw something different in his eyes, something I had not seen before. There was also sincerity, a fierce loyalty, and a singularly driven purpose in his gaze. Sully, I've been away from home for longer than I can remember. Away from home means away from family, bed, hearth, and almost always decent food. You will not relieve my longing for family bed and hearth, but you certainly solved the need for food. That was the finest damn meal I've ever had on the trail. William T. Anderson, commander of the Kansas First Guerrillas, but should we ever meet again on the trail, you can call me Bill. Should that ever happen, I'd welcome your cooking, but would also like to sit and enjoy it with you. I'll bet we could swap a story or two. Once again, I saw the hidden softer sides of this man in his eyes as he released my hand. I would consider that an honor, sir. You and your men are a pleasure to serve, and I'd be happy to do so again, I answered. He simply gave me a nod, and as he turned, said once again, Hmm, damn fine food. He walked away back to his camp with Fletch by his side. I never saw that man again, but as history now records, I had just met, fed, and exchanged pleasantries with one of the most notorious figures of the Civil War. That was bloody Bill Anderson. Since that night, I've read multiple accounts of his, this man, including the fact that he was killed in battle just a few short months after our meeting. But I'll not comment on his politics or actions here. For me, he was simply another hungry person who I fed and fed well, though in retrospect, there's no doubt that my impression of his dangerous side were extremely well-founded. I'm glad I could cook. But that was not to be the last of my meetings that night. It was some time later, as I was sitting by my own fire, that four other men approached. These four men were in a much lighter and more jovial mood, and I heard from far, there's a hand here that I'd like to shake, said one, and it's the hand of the man that's made my belly happier than it's been in a very long time. I stood and watched as the four men approached. The one that had spoken extended his hand. We've come to thank you in person. My name's Frank. This little squirt here is my brother Jesse, and these other two good-for-nothings are my cousins Cole and Jim. As with so many of the events in my life, I had no idea at the time that these were anyone other than common men, but again, how little I knew. I was about to enjoy the company of those who would become the most notorious outlaws of the American West. Jesse and Frank James and Cole and Jim Younger, the foundations of the James Younger gang. 
But of course, I would only come to realize that some years later. As for that night, I found them to be terrific company. Frank had the natural air of the leader of the group. He was a thin man, I guess about six feet tall, but he carried himself in a way that made him seem larger. He seemed well educated and mannered and spoke with a certain softness and directness that commanded you listen carefully. Jesse, on the other hand, while only slightly taller, was a more burly man even though he was only about 16 years of age. He had just recently joined with the group, having only then reached the age for fighting. And while all four of the men readily expressed their hatred of everything Union, Jesse's, it seemed, had a more personal and burning origin. You see, the previous spring, he recounted, Union forces had raided his family's home, a practice not uncommon by both sides during the war, and during the course of the raid, Jesse had been bound, lashed, and mocked by the Union soldiers. I suspect that had he just been bound and lashed, he might well have become a common enough soldier. But in his telling of the story, it became clear that their mocking set a determination in Jesse that would never diminish. It was impossible to look him in the eye without seeing the wildness that burned in his heart along with a focus that would not be denied. Cole Younger, 20 years old at the time, was a large, powerful looking man, standing right at 6 feet tall, but I'm guessing he weighed well over 200 pounds. With his sandy whiskers and balding head, he presented a figure of pure intimidation. His brother Jim, also 16 years at the time, was a tad bit shorter and much smaller in build. He was a quiet, well-mannered young man. Through the course of the evening, he did more listening than talking. The five of us conversed for hours around that fire, each of us talking about our respective past and what had brought us to that place and time. Jesse and I in particular made a connection, both of us being about the same young age, but finding ourselves in situations that, while vastly different, had the commonality of being typically associated with older men. He was fascinated by my stories of Ireland, my transition to America, New York, and how I was making my way through the West. While our conversation took many twists and turns that evening, there was one part that I feel needs to be recounted here as close as I can word for word. They were talking about what they'd do after winning the war when Frank asked a dead serious question aimed straight at Jesse. What if we lose the war, Jess? What then? What the hell are you talking about, Frank? answered Jesse with a look of having been offended by the very mention of the possibility. No way we lose this war. Ain't a one of them Yanks worth a damn, especially up against the James and Youngers. I know. I know that, Jesse. You're a tough man answered Frank, but with a slight glint in his eye. But in every war, there's a loser, and every loser thought he was going to win, else why he wouldn't be in the fight in the first place. So just for conversation, suppose we do lose. What are you going to do then? Jesse appeared to recognize that his older brother's question was serious and would demand an answer. So he paused a moment, and he stirred the fire with a stick, and then, having collected his thoughts, looked back at Frank. Well, I'll tell you this much, I ain't surrendering to, to, to no Union troop. Hell, they'll probably shoot us for the trouble in trying. He paused again and then got deadly serious and continued. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll keep doing exactly what we're doing now, but we'll do it for ourselves. We'll gather us up, some other like-minded boys, ride where we want, take what we need, and live like kings however we want. And with that, he pumped his fist and I could see the wildness in his eyes once again. Hell yes, chimed in Cole. We'll call ourselves the Younger James Gang. Jesse took on a surprised look and answered back half laughing. Well, I guess that makes it my gang since I am the Younger James. We all laughed out loud at Jesse's quick-witted twist of words. No sooner had the laugh settled down did Frank add in, Well, Jesse, that all sounds great until we all end up shot or in prison or more likely both. That statement seemed to quiet them all as their thoughts returned to the realities of the fights they'd been in and those yet to come. Was I there at, was I part of, the foundation of the James Younger Gang? The history I've read about them does not include when and how they came to be, but for me it all began right then and there, sitting around the fire after a meal of beef, boxed in soda bread, cooked and served by yours truly. As the evening wore on, I got to know Jesse James, and I'll say this here and now. No matter your opinion of the things he did after the war, at heart he was a good man and fine. It is my firm opinion that it was a combination of the time and place in which he was born, 
followed by events both during and immediately after the war that created the Jesse James history debates. Jesse James did not set out to create history. History created Jesse James. He was my friend, and I curse the coward, whose name I will not give honor of mentioning here, who killed him many years later. I was destined to meet him under vastly different circumstances one more time in my life, but that's another chapter yet to be written. Eventually that day's events began to catch up with all of us, and the conversation flowed. And so I'm guessing sometime well after midnight, Jesse, Frank, Jim, and Cole rose from their seats to rejoin the troop. Each shook my hand, and again we all agreed that it had been a fine evening. I watched as the four of them disappeared out of my firelight. I was careful to rise early the next morning, and the story continues. I hope you liked it. Now, was that story true? No, of course not. But like every story in Sully's American West, it could have been true based on the historical characters and their locations and events at the time. Sully's American West is historical fiction, and Sully's story continues on as he meets, and in most cases befriends, Jesse James and his gang again. Wyatt Earp, again. Billy the Kid, again. And also Wild Bill Hickok, Doc Holliday, Bat Masterson, Pat Garrett, and more in the midst of the Old West's most notorious events. The Battle of Westport, the Kansas Cowtowns, the James Gang disastrous raid on Northfield the Lincoln County War, Tombstone, the Oklahoma Land Runs, the tragedy at Wounded Knee, the fall of the Daltons in Coffeyville, and the greatest gun battle of the Old West in Ingalls, Oklahoma. Sully's American West is a celebration of the greatest characters, events, and yes, stories of America's Old West, all told with historical accuracy, but also with a whole lot of fun and Sully's own great story wrapped around them. For that reason, I hope you'll enjoy my book, Sully's American West, it's available as an ebook on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and other popular ebook outlets. Or, if you prefer, I also hope that you'll continue to visit me here on YouTube, at my Facebook page, and check out my website at www.edwardagraves.com for more Old West stories. As always, your subscriptions on YouTube, likes, comments, shares, and especially your book purchases are very much appreciated. Until the next time, all the best to you and yours. See you next time.